Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Let's Figure Out What's Wrong With This Airport. <clears throat> okay. There's a farm in the middle of it. Um, there's a man living in it. Uh, one of the runways has a road going through it for some reason. Uh, sucks. Crosses the U.S. Canada border. 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 Cro wait, wait a minute. Why, why do so many airports cross the U.S. Canada border? Well, these airfields date back, like half of the weird things we talk about on this channel, to World War II. Specifically, the lame part of World War II, before the U.S. declared war on Germany and tore Hitler apart with their legion of sword-wielding war eagles. You see, from 1939 to 1941, the U.S. was a neutral nation. A fact I learned from this official Canadian government website, where they call Americans stupid with not one, but two exclamation marks. The reasons for American neutrality aren't that important for this video, but just try, if you can, to imagine that a megalomaniac world leader has just invaded a European nation and uh, oh, you can't imagine that. Okay, so basically, the reason why you don't want to die in a war right now is the same reason people didn't want to die in a war 80 years ago. As things began heating up in 1935, the U.S. passed the Neutrality Act, prohibiting the export of all weapons, ammunition, and other implements of war, and in inspiring that famous FDR quote, get your mitts off my guns. That position, of course, didn't last very long because it was becoming increasingly clear that Hitler was secretly a Nazi. So with a few more acts in 1937 and 1939, the US added some legal loopholes to their neutrality policy that would allow them to sell planes to England without officially choosing sides because, you know, that would probably hurt Hitler's feelings. The policy they came up with was this. Any country could purchase arms from the United States, but only on two conditions. One, they paid up front in cash, and two, they transported the goods themselves. Basically, your standard drug dealer's policy. If these rules sound a little random to you, it's because they are. The only reason they were chosen was to make it almost impossible for Nazi Germany to take advantage of the US's not-so-neutral neutrality. You see, if the Nazis were notorious for one thing, it was their inability to pay for military equipment up front. Their economy was mainly held up by deficit financing on the premise that they would eventually take over the entire world, kind of like how Amazon works, except Amazon actually pulled it off. Given their relatively low cash reserves, the Nazis wouldn't have been able to pay for planes up front, and even if they did scrape together enough dough to buy the planes, transporting them to Europe all by themselves would be a no-go given that they didn't have the ships to do it, and England controlled pretty much the entire Atlantic. The only countries that could have realistically taken advantage of this cash and carry policy were England and France, at least until France surrendered nine months later. Now Sam, you must be saying, I've been sitting here, very politely, listening to you talk about 1930s US foreign policy, but I don't pay you to talk about 1930s US foreign policy, I pay you to talk about weird little airports. And well, first of all, no you don't, but second of all, I'm getting there! By the end of 1939, England and France were both desperate for those zoomy boomy boys, but sending aircraft carriers all the way to the United States was a waste of time and money, especially considering that most of the planes were capable of flying to Europe on their own. They just couldn't legally take off from US soil. So the US did what the US does best, came up with a legal loophole for their legal loophole. It turns out that there's actually this whole other country right up here called ken a -da. It sounds wild, I know, but they have their own Wikipedia page and everything. Since Canada had already declared war on Germany, planes could legally be flown from Canada to other allied countries, but the US still needed a way to get the planes across the border into Canada. Technically, they could have dismantled the planes and shipped them to Canada via train, but that would have cost extra time and money, and the planes really struggled to kill Nazis when they were in 300 pieces. So instead, the manufacturers found two airfields, one in Sweetgrass, Montana, and one in Coots, Alberta. The only thing separating them were a fence and an international border, so they went ahead and tore down the fence, accidentally admitting Canada into the Union as the 51st state. From then on, planes could be flown right into Sweetgrass, emptied of fuel, and left right at the edge of the US-Canada border. Neither country's military was allowed to move the planes over the border themselves, so Canadian citizens would hitch the empty planes to horses or tractors and drag them to the Canadian side of the airfield, where the Canadian Air Force could then legally refuel them, fly them to Calgary, and then finally deliver them to Europe. If that's not bureaucratic efficiency, I don't know what it is. Really, I don't know what it is. I have no idea what bureaucratic means. The Coots Sweetgrass airfield ended up being such a hit that the US and Canada set up a bunch of other border crossing airfields, six of which are still in use today. Although as far as I can tell, this one actually has nothing to do with transporting warplanes. They just somehow ran out of room in northern Minnesota sometime in the 70s, and Canada very politely let them borrow some of Manitoba. But uh, that's a way less cool story, so we'll keep that our little secret. But hey, what if I told you that you could help the ongoing Ukrainian war effort by dragging planes across international borders just like the Canadians did during World War II? Well, you can't, obviously, for like a hundred reasons. But that's okay, because I found a way better way to support the victims of this crisis without getting up from your computer or spending a dime. It's our sponsor, Tab for a Cause. Tab for a Cause is an amazing and effortless way to contribute to charities of your choice just by installing their browser extension and using the internet as usual. How does it work? 
Well, it's pretty simple. Every time you open a new tab, instead of a blank page, you'll get this customizable homepage with pictures and a couple of banner ads. If you're interested in helping the Ukrainian families affected by the war, TAF for Causes partnered with Save the Children to provide much-needed food, services, and other supplies. There's really no catch here. All their code is open source, and their detailed financial reports are all published online. So if you want to add to the $60,000 that HEI viewers have raised for nonprofits so far, all you have to do is press this button on screen or follow the link in the description, install the extension, and continue browsing the web.